OK, everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, Council's meeting this evening. The first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Um, Sir Evans, please. Thank you, Presiding Member. I have apologies from Peter Black, Nicola Furlong, Louise Gibbard, Hannah Lawson, Paul Lloyd, David Phillips and Rob Stewart. Any others? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yvonne Jardine. Thank you. Councillor Matthews. Mandy Evans. Thank you. Councillor Fogarty. Sarah Keaton. OK. Is that everybody? Sarah Keaton. OK. The next item is the disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests. Can I call on Deb, please? To... Thank you, Presiding Member. I've sent out a, an email this afternoon to um, councillors in relation to uh, tonight's agenda. A uh, particular reference to agenda item 12, Swansea Replacement Local Development Plan, Final Delivery Agreements and Next Steps. Um, I've given some advice in that email. If you have a, um, a beneficial interest in any site specifically referenced in the report, then you should declare a personal interest. If any decision on a site referenced in the report might reasonably be regarded as affecting your well-being or financial position or that of a person with whom you live or any person with whom you have a close personal association, then again, you should declare a personal interest. This, uh, these do not constitute um, prejudicial interests at this stage, just personal only. Um, does anybody have any interest to declare, please? Mr Rice. It's working now. I've got a personal interest in um, item 10 and item 11. Thank you. Can it's you not prejudicial. Forms in, that's all. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, Councillor Brain. 13. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I, item 13, personal interest. On the yeah, no, yeah, I've got the same number as Jess. I declare that it's a personal. And I would. Anybody else? No? OK, we move on to the minutes to approve and sign the minutes of the previous meeting as a correct record, and that's pages 1 to 33. I'll go through them page by page. It's page 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's one meeting. The next one is 7, 8. 9, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. Okay. Everybody agree that it's yeah, more happy to move, uh, move uh, the minutes. Thank you, Lee. Happy to second. Thank you. Okay. The next item is the written responses to questions asked at the last ordinary meeting of Council, and that's those are on pages 34 to 39. I then move on to the announcements of the presiding member. Unfortunately, I'm starting off with condolences, and it's for the former Lady Mayoress Anne James, who was the wife of the former honorary alderman, former Lord Mayor, and former councillor Dennis H. James. It's with sadness that I refer to the recent death of former Lady Mayoress Anne James. Anne was the wife of former honorary alderman, former Lord Mayor, and former councillor Dennis James. Anne was a Lady Mayoress in 20 in 2012 to 2013. The next is Bill Evans, who was the husband of Councillor Mandy Evans. It's with sadness that I refer to the recent death of Bill Evans, husband of Councillor Mandy Evans. The next is Morgan Riddler, Morgan's Army Charitable Foundation. 
It's with sadness that I refer to the recent death of Morgan Riddler. Morgan had cancer and his parents, Natalie and Matthew, set up a Morgan's Army Charitable Foundation to raise awareness of many types of childhood cancers and share their journey would help many others feel less alone. Morgan passed away in June 23 and the Charitable Foundation is the legacy of love. Donations can be given via www.morgansarmony.co.uk. The next one is Neymat Lola Ismail, Ismail, I think it is, and Mohammed Ismail from West Cross. It's with sadness that I refer to the recent death of Neymat Lola Ismail and Mohammed Ismail. Neymat and his son both sat, died following the house fire in West Cross. And can you all stand, please, in a mark of respect? The next is a little bit better news. It's the King's Birthday Honours for 2023. It's the citizens of Swansea who received awards in the Queen's Birthday Honours. First one is Commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE, and that's Professor Medwin Hughes, DL, Vice Chancellor, University of Wales and University of Wales Trinity St David's Group. Services to education and to the Welsh language. The next is the member of the Order of the British Empire, MBE, and that's for Elizabeth Ann Ricks, who is the Chief Nurse in Portsmouth Hospitals, University NHS Trust, Services to Nursing Leadership, Swansea, West Glamorgan. Non Rhiannid Stanford, Services to Triathlon in Wales, Leeds, West Yorkshire. The British Empire Medal, BEM, for John Leslie Stewart Griffiths, Coach Swansea Harriers Athletics Club for services to athletics in Wales, Swansea, West Glamorgan. The next is Phil Sharman, the Governors and Audit Committee. Phil Sharman has recently resigned as an independent statutory co-opted member of the Governors and Audit Committee. Phil commenced the role in 2022. On behalf of the authority, I'd like to thank Phil for his time and commitment over the past 14 months. The next announcement is Martin Nichols, Chief Executive. Mm -hmm. Council will be aware that Martin, has, our Chief Executive, has been receiving treatment for a form of leukaemia and that he is responding well. As a result, Martin has signed up to a charity 5K Pretty Muddy event in Singleton Park on the 29th of July 2023 to raise money for cancer research. Any sponsorship for this worthy cause would be very much appreciated. The next item is Gower College Swansea Student Awards 2023. Swansea Council has a strong relationship with Gower College Swansea. The Council works closely with them to deliver training in a range of areas, including apprenticeships and the management development programme as part of the workforce strategy. I'm delighted to state that Swansea Council won the Gower College Swansea Employer Partner of the Year Award. OK, so well done to everybody. That's the end of my announcement. Thank you. The next is the announcements of the leader of the council. Over to you, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thanks, President, uh, presiding member. What I would say that Rob, the leader, has given me a list of about thirty announcements, but I, I'll skip through them as fast as I possibly can. I'm um, I'm quite aware that we had a fantastic air show last weekend, and I think as a tribute must be said to our events team, not just an events team, but but everybody that takes part in this. It's a, it's very much a team effort. We had 180,000 thereabouts that uh, celebrated the air show. I think it's a fantastic uh, thing that we do, and hopefully we can continue to do so. And uh, I would like particularly to pay tribute to Councillor Robert Francis Davis and his team. Uh, for the work that they've done, as I say, across the authority. So that, that was a great event and look forward to next year 
perhaps we can uh, merge this with uh, the British Armed Forces Day that uh, we will be remembering on the 6th and 7th of July next year and will coincide with the air show. So I think it'll be an exciting event uh, across Swansea Bay. And again, thanks to all. We go on to Pendering. Very pleased to announce this part of our regeneration across the, the, the river. And we've got Pendering opening now on the 13th, so the next week tomorrow. I'm really happy to see that we're going to have over a million bottles exported um, worldwide. I'm sure we'll have many in the city sampled ourselves uh, over, over the forthcoming uh, months, no doubt. And I'm also very pleased to announce that tomorrow we'll be opening the, the new refurbishment at uh, Bishopston School. Uh, there's over £50 million pounds that, that, that have been spent on that school. I think it's a fantastic project. It's been working uh, in a live school with pupils, and it's been a really difficult project to manage. But again, congratulations to Kia uh, on, on that one. Also this month, um, we had the pleasure of travelling to London for the NJ Awards. Unfortunately, we didn't get no silver on this particular occasion, but we were certainly uh, runners-up again for the City of the Year. Not only did we um, was was put in for City of the Year and shortlisted for that, we also took um, we were also find this for for the More Homes project. It was great to be accompanied by, and I know Councillor Andrew Lewis is very proud of the work that's been taking place. But we also took an apprentice with us to that award, and very disappointed we didn't win it. We still think we should have, and I think it's a tribute to the work that we have been doing, particularly. And the, the More Homes project was the nomination for West Cross, so. Um, I think it's a fantastic job, and I, and the, I must say the apprentice made the most of it. He enjoyed every part of it, in fairness to him, so it was great to be there. Uh, that is the end of my announcements today. I've got no further announcements. You'd be pleased to know. Thank you, Claire, Councillor Hopkins. The next is the public questions. We've got 15 minutes. I've got some public questions from a Mr Houghton. Sorry, Mr Edwards. You want to get Sorry, yeah. Um, a gentleman had submitted questions, but he's not here to ask them, so the questions fall. Thank you. <clears throat> the next item, then, is the Governance and Audit Committee Annual Report for 22-23. I'd like to call on Paula Connor to give the report, please. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Presiding Member. <laughs> Um, I'm pleased to present this report again this year to the full council. I'm assuming everyone has read this report, um, but I will um, go through some summary points just to highlight some of those. The report outlines how the Governance and Audit Committee has discharged its duties in accordance with its terms of reference. With regards to the membership, the, the full council agreed that the membership would be set at 15 members to comply with legislative requirements and 10 elected members, five lay members. Um, during 2022, uh, membership was mostly achieved with four lay members sitting at the, on the committee and the fifth uh, member joined in April 23. And from this point in time, the committee was compliant with legislation in total. Um, you've just heard the presiding member mentioning Phil Sharman has since resigned and I understand uh, there's some discussion ongoing as to the future size of the membership of that committee um, as we speak. So um, I can report on that once the decision is made as to whether it remains the same, recruit another lay member or whether the committee size reduces. So that's in the hands of, of democratic services and, and other key players involved. Um, during 2022-23, there's been continual liaison between the Chair of Scrutiny and the Chair of um, the Scrutiny Performance Board, with the aim of ensuring that there's clarity and harmony of responsibilities across each of those groups, um, because I'm keen to make sure there's no overlap, there's no duplication, and we sit within the remit of, of our, re yeah. our roles. Um, there are a number of areas the Governance and Audit Committee have expressed some concern around, which are contained in the report. But just to briefly summarise, they relate to workforce capacity and capability, including the use of agency and management of sickness, performance management, ICT disaster recovery, procurement, and just to add that all those areas are stated in the Council's annual governance statement. So there's absolute clarity of where there's the improvements needed um, as we move forward into 2023. In addition, I'd like to mention the Governance and Audit Subcommittee of the South West Wales Corporate Joint Committee, 
Um, that the governance and audit subcommittee has not met since November 2022. I've informed the leader and the chief executive of this. Um, there was a meeting plan for July this month, um, but that was cancelled with an explanation that came with that, that a robust work programme has been worked on and that would be presented to that meeting in the autumn of 23. Um, so at the same moment in time, there is no uh, activity around the Governance and Audit Subcommittee. Having said that, there is an oversight by the Scrutiny Subcommittee. So there's not a total gap, there is activity going around on that. Um, during the, the year, the committee received assurance um, from the work of the Chief Auditor of the Council, Audit Wales, um, the Governance Group via Councillor Leslie Walton, um, plus the attendance at the Governance Committee by the directors of various services. And it's important to give the directors an opportunity to give assurance to the committee that they manage in the areas of business tightly. Um, looking forward, the committee is absolutely committed to delivering its responsibilities sorry, responsibilities in accordance with its terms of reference. Um, and the committee members are also fully engaged in the training programme to ensure that all members remain effective and up to date with the current um, speed. Um, finally, I'd like to thank all members of the committee for their commitment and enthusiasm at the meetings, and also the Vice Chair, uh, Councillor Paxson Hood-Williams, for his support. And I'd also like to thank auditors, both internal and external, Office of the Council and also to Jeremy from Democratic Services for supporting the work of the committee. Um, I wouldn't want to go any further than that. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Member Proposer first, please. Yeah, I just would like to um, actually propose the report. I actually think it's, it's a very good report. What I would uh, like to add to this is I'd like to thank Paula for her professionalism and also a stamina on some occasions for the time the meetings tend to go on. So I really do appreciate the effort and, and that you do there. So I'd, I'd like to propose the uh, report to Council. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you. Uh, happy to second, uh, presiding member, and echo the comments of Councillor Hopkins. My thanks to the committee. Can I go to the vote then, please? Are all those in favour of the report? Anybody against? Any abstentions? I'm sorry, Mr. Evans, I can't see if there's any hands up online because I can't see behind me. OK, thank you. OK. The next item is. Is excuse me, is the review of the policy on licensing and sex establishments, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thanks, Presiding Member. This is um, a five-year review of this policy. There's uh, been very little amendments. This has been out of consultation. There's been no responses to consultation. And uh, what I would say that um, there's minimum changes. It's just just cleaning up exercise where we've got to do every five years, readopt this policy. So I'd like to, like to uh, move the policy and more than willing to take any questions. Councillor yes, Lewis. Very happy to second, Presiding Member. Thank you. For a good vote, I've got to speak. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with the policy and I think it, it's sensible. There's one item I think that's worth considering adding to the policy. Um, and I know when I was a cabinet member for property and finance back about 10 years or so ago, we had some issues with establishments trying to set up in council um, owned or freeholded land. And I would like to see if we could to make sure that we've maintained the principle that we had then, which is ensuring that we don't allow anybody where we have the head lease, freehold or ownership of the building to set up or facilitate a sex establishment within our own property. And I think that would be a good thing for the council to continue to do. I think the last one that we did have was um, sometime in York Street in 2012. Uh, we've had none since then and I re reaffirm that commitment. OK, we move to the vote then. Everybody in favour of the report? Show of hands, please. Thank you. Anybody against? Any abstentions? OK, that vote is carried. Thank you. Next item is item 10, and it's the review of the statement of policy for licensing. Again, Councillor Hopkins. 
Yeah, this is a similar report where it's a clean up exercise of staffy obligation where we've got to readopt the policy for licensing and review the policy. Review has taken place. There have been some amendments on uh, some of the appendix, appendices. They've been highlighted. Um, there's been extensive consultation on this and uh, there are no responses, only because there were very, very little changes to, to the existing policy. So, again, very much um, readopting an existing policy. More than happy to move and take any questions. Second, please. Thank you. Happy to second. Thank you. OK, we move to the vote then, please. Everybody in favour for? Anybody against? Any abstentions? OK, that's uh, moved. Thank you very much. The next item is the proposal to publish cumulative impact assessment on the city centre. Again, I think it's you, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, like that says, it all come at once. My reports on it, in fairness. <laughs> uh, what I would say is that it's um, this this uh, cumulative impact assessment that there has been delayed because of the, the evidence gathering over uh, the lack of evidence sorry, over the COVID period. This report sets out the the background of the report and, and looks at if we could then go to advert. We've um, there is there is some difference this policy now and because it's it's all integrated with the council's licensing policy as well. So more than happy to take any questions, but more to be honest, I'm more than happy just to move the report and uh, go to advert on this particular one. Yeah, I, I can never say the first, uh, Chris, and I'll bring. Thank you. Can, can, can we, second. I think part of the problem is people don't understand what the policy is, and members should understand how important this is. And I think at some stage, maybe we should have some form of not seminar, but an explanation of what this is about sent out to members, because this is incredibly important to our city centre. Um, we've got enough problems in the city centre with a lack of retail, uh, but and this is something that we need to be safeguarding to make sure that people feel safe and the city centre is accountable. So I could ask the leader, if the deputy leader, if he could make it uh, possible that people and uh, send a briefing note on what this means. Yeah, I can confirm I will get a briefing note, but I wouldn't, I, I would go as far and get a problem, get a memo seminar on this particular issue, because I think to the city centre is very important what we do as the city centre. So I got no, no problem in trying to set up a, um, some type of seminar and included perhaps in in what, what we do with the blue flag and everything else within the city centre. You are right, everything depends on each other within that particular area. So more than happy to uh, to take that on board. Councillor Hopkins, Councillor Rice. I note from the report that um, the police are very interested in uplands as an area and obviously with the growth of number of establishments in recent years, I'd like to see us um, carry out a similar cumulative impact assessment in our area because it is obviously an area of growth and it has an impact on a residential community. Could I, could I just say I have already had this, this conversation with officers. There are, I am looking at it, can't give a commitment when, but what I said, I have already started a conversation. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Can I have a show of hands to support the report, please? Anybody against? Any abstentions? Okay, the report is moved. We move on to item 12, and that's the Swansea Replacement Local Development Plan, the RLDP, the final delivery agreement, and the next steps. Again, Councillor Hopkins, please. Yeah, now the trouble starts. Come on. I, I, I'm waiting for Wendy for Cheryl to give me all, Councillor Wendy for Cheryl to have all the questions, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyway, it's nice to see you back in the chamber. What I would say, I believe I've got Tom Evans on board to take some technical questions. Before I bring him in, I think it's only right and proper. But if you look at the current LDP, it was adopted over four years ago. It continues to be a, a groundbreaking development plan, the first in Wales to, to put the placemaking agenda at the core. And being shortlisted for um, the RTPI award for the very reason and provided the, the sound constant approach to planning, design and placemaking. I think we're very fortunate um, as a council to have Tom Evans with us, who's, who leads on this particular one. What I will say at this particular time, um, as you know, it's, it's, it's a national requirement for, uh, for every four years to review the LDP and to rebuild evidence-based case 
and ensuring the, the plan reflects the latest information and development priorities. In, in terms of, of the delivery agreement, um, in particular, I would like to draw members' attention to the community involvement scheme. And in particular, if, if the delivery agreement is clear and a wide variety of individual, individual groups and internal, stake, internal stakeholders and members will be invited and encouraged to get involved in shaping the this replacement plan. It is important to build a consensus of including shaping and overarching objectives aspiring the strategy and policies of the proposal of this plan. I urge members to note that the consultation submitted and responses and approve these important consultation documents in a final form to pave the way to start the redevelopment process. Today is about looking forward, about what, what can we do to reshape the city centre going forward. And I would like to bring attention to page 207, 208, with some ambitious timelines that take us to 2026. Um, and I, I just say I will give some commitment to you today that we will have a further member seminar on this particular issue. And I also, uh, before I bring Tommy, would like to make a commitment that we will have perhaps some specialist user groups or individuals, including councillors, who can come forward to help us develop this this work, in this, this this plan in, in the shape, shape of um, uh, working uh, yeah, working plan. So I'm more than happy to move this report. But Tom is with us at a particular time to ask any technical questions, and I'm sure that uh, Councillor Fitzgerald will have many. Never second a first, and I call Tom. Thank you, Presiding Member. Very happy to second uh, this report, and also to give my thanks to Councillor Hopkins, Tom, and the team who've been involved. This is a huge piece of work. So my thanks to the Cabinet Member for all the work involved in this. And please. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I, I will, um, I will just reflect really on those, um, those final words that you mentioned there in terms of the importance of bringing uh, all members with us now on this journey for a replacement plan. This, uh, you know, we are, we are four years uh, beyond, you know, down, down the track in terms of when the existing plan was was adopted, and uh, as has been mentioned, there is this requirement now to um, refresh. All the sort of evidence that it's that it's based on, um, and some of our areas of policy that we have as a council. Obviously, the world has uh, uh, has changed in many ways in that in that four four years, and some of the areas of uh, of evidence. You know, there's been some quite profound um, economic, socio economic uh, shocks to, um, uh, to that, that we've all felt dur during that time, and it's only right to, that um, that we do reflect on on those, and and we we, we make sure that our our development plan is. Is is based on the very latest uh, information there, so that is what we'll be doing. Uh, and uh, you know, I would just highlight the importance now of of, of these recommendations being taken forward, so that uh, officers can get on with with this this process, start in earnest, and uh, start progressing through the key stages that are all set out in the. Uh, in 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 the report there and its uh, and its appendices, uh, and and finally I will just emphasise that uh, the uh, stakeholder engagement throughout will be done at each of those key stages, and and I'll certainly be making sure that um, officers are in uh, myself and other officers are in touch to set up some of those member groups so that um, there is that. Uh, uh, political engagement as we go forward. So I'm I'm uh, I'm happy, as the cabinet member said, to take any uh, any questions at all that uh, members have got today, or if you'd like to follow up in in writing, um, I will certainly um, get those responded to as well. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I got. Do you want to come back in? Uh, yeah, could I just say today is not about particular sites. In, in my opinion, today is about looking forward and building on on the evidence based plan that will come forward. Today is about setting that agenda and and that ambitious target of january 2026 i think is very very ambitious and i would hope we could stick to that because it is a crucial timeline so the engagement starts now after this after this uh, meeting where we we start that stakeholder groups going forward 
just a couple of technical questions, really, I think, for, for Mr. Evans. Um, when would be the best stage or what's the best stage to put forward any ideas or any proposals on supplementary planning guidance? And also, when would be the best time to put any principles down, which may change the focus of the LDP in terms of policy? Um, what I have in mind there, for instance, is to make sure that there's a preference towards brownfield site rather than greenfield development. And also to look at some of the candidate sites and opportunities there are with existing sites which haven't been developed for maybe 30 years. Have, for example, what ideas like Valindra and such like. Yeah, that's great. I'll I'll come straight back on 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 those. So yeah, two two really important questions. In in terms of if I take the second one first. Um, because that relates to quite an early stage of the process. That is is all about, you know, what are our sort of fundamental objectives? What are we all about really in, to, in, in trying to uh, achieve with the new development plan? Uh, and some of that uh, vision setting, that objective setting is done early stage, and, and that will be towards the end of this year uh, and into early next. That you'll certainly be hearing about engagement um, happening on 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 that, and members will be brought in, in into that process. Um, and in respect of the candidate uh, site stage and how that relates to uh, existing brownfield and previously developed land, that starts even earlier. Uh, in the process and you know part of the recommendation now is to uh, uh, agree that we get on with that and I would anticipate that we'll be wanting to invite the submissions of those uh, those those candidate sites throughout August September possibly into October uh, from all sort of in interested parties and and those kind of and the assessment that's done then on those potential sites for allocation is done with the benefit of a full review of what available brownfield land there is. Uh, so it is one of the key, you know, there's a number of key areas of, of underpinning evidence that, uh, that are, uh, are underway already. Uh, and um, the, those include getting to grips with the scale of growth that we want to uh, aspire to. Uh, in the uh, as a council and within the development plan, understanding that, and then that is sort of matched against well, um, what is the available land that we've got within settlement limits to to, um, to 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 do that on, and do we need any allocations beyond uh, brownfield land uh, by way of uh, greenfield allocation? So that's the process we go through, and when we're assessing. Um, uh, candidate site, as I say, it's done with the benefit of that sort of underpinning um, evidence then. Uh, going back to the, the initial one then was on, in relation to supplementary planning guidance. So that comes a little bit later in the process when we get into a level of detail on areas of policy, some of the specific themes and some of the or, uh, uh, potentially site specific uh, policies and proposals. Uh, as those policies become drafted, there will be references in that to uh, the potential for supplementary guidance where we don't think it's best placed in the development plan. And um, some, of, some of the information goes into planning guidance then, um, and that will be the stage where some of that is, um, uh, is, is proposed. But again, rest assured, I would say as those policies are being drafted, uh, the, the, sort, the sort of uh, member group uh, that should be that, and that will be convened to discuss some of those policy areas will be able to uh, kick around some of those ideas on uh, policy and on supplementary guidance. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Councillor Fitzgerald, do you wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got several questions, but I will submit them in writing. I think it might be easier because they are fairly technical. The one thing I would like confirmed is in this call for candidate sites, um, are we taking into account, and I assume we must be, national data? Because what is coming out from the Welsh Government is, uh, I, I would suggest, um, perhaps conflicting in some ways with the 
situation we have with housing numbers. Um, so I assume, am I right in assuming that national data coming out from the Welsh Government is or has been taken into account? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm making the assumption that the reference of national data there is, 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 that, is in relation to sort of national legislation, national planning policy, uh, national guidance and the, and, the, and, the, and the manual produced by Welsh Government, that kind of thing. And yeah, absolutely the, um, uh, the process that's followed, including the candidate sites process, is, needs to be in accordance with, with that, um, uh, that which is set at national level. Thank you. Thank you for that. It just seems to me that with all the figures that we now have available, it seems that in Swansea, we have actually more or less met our housing requirement up to about 2040. Um, I, I, as I say, I, I've been looking at the bigger figures and uh, it does seem, you know, we have a particular situation here and that looking at the situation, um, you know, with, the, with Neath, Port Talbot, Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire, um, there is a fairly low level of housing required across all those four counties. Um, and we seem to have met our requirement already, let alone projecting into the future. I, I'll, I'll pick up on that that again, um, if if I may, because it, it raises a really good point, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, in the, in that you know since one of the changes in circumstance since the adoption of the uh, current LDP is the publication of Future Wales, and for those that aren't uh, aren't aware, that is the National Development Plan for Wales. It has the same status as our uh, local development plan for decision making. And that has been uh, adopted by by government uh, in the intervening time. And um, as as you've set out there, councillor, that there are uh, some policies within it, proposals within Future Wales that talk about levels of growth uh, anticipated within the region, the wider region within which Swansea sits. So yes, there is a requirement that the plans that come forward underneath Future Wales have regard to that and it and it and what, what it says is that our this council's development plan uh, needs to have uh, be set within its context and explain why the level of growth that it we are going to propose is what it is whether if you know justify if it's less than for what reason or if it's more than some of those figures in Future Wales for Tom, what reason. Tom sorry can, can I come in I think we struggle. I'm struggling in the front row here, particularly with the acoustics of the, of the room. I don't know whether anybody else did. I'm, I'm getting the same impression from from the opposition. Can I suggest we we answer that question in writing? Because I am. It is echoing round here, and I'm I'm losing it a little bit. And I think I'm getting nods from the opposition this particular time as well. Yeah. So more than happy to take that that question in writing if you want. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Councillor Will Thomas, did you indicate, please? Uh, yes, I did, but I, I'm online, obviously, so I don't know if it's echoing the same. Um, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, and you can make the decision whether you answer or not. Um, the the call for sites, I'm just wondering how that impacts on uh, rural exception sites, because obviously, they, as being exception sites, they'd be outside of the LDP. But I just wonder, because I know one was uh, involved in the LDP last time, so just wonder if we could cover that, please. Yeah, I, I, I'll come straight back on that. I don't know. Whether you can hear me okay in the in the chamber, but I'll 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 carry on. Uh, in terms of how the question is, how does it impact on rural exception sites? Uh, again, I'll make the uh, the assumption that you mean. Uh, will there be a uh, an invitation for the submission of sites for rural exception sites, if that's what you mean? And and um, yes, uh, the 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 process essentially invites the submission of any site for a uh, potential allocation of a range of uh, land uses. Uh, the, the, the process makes absolutely clear there is no commitment on the behalf of the council to allocate anything that is submitted. 
but but what what the process requires is for the council to essentially invite uh, 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 any submissions to come forward wherever it is. The the guidance note will set out the the, the parameters within which we will be assessing sites. Uh, for example, uh, it, it will make clear the national requirement for um, sites not to be isolated in the middle of the, of the open countryside. So people can still submit that, but uh, it, it, it'll be clear that that will be contrary to national um, guidance. So we submit, we invite those submissions and then the, the council will over time make its decisions on which sites should be allocated for what sort of uses. Thank you, Mr. Evans. I can't see anybody else indicating. Did you want to come back in? Paxton Hood. Oh, sorry. Paxton Williams. You're on mute. Thank you, Madam Presiding Member. One quick question, really, I think. If I remember correctly, I think the Welsh Government were telling us prior to last LDP we had to find sufficient land for about 17,500 households. Um, has that figure changed? Or is it going to change? Or how, where, do, where are we in that respect? Yeah, so to come back on that, this, this goes back to what I mentioned in terms of the underpinning evidence. So it's one of the key areas of work that needs to be done for a replacement plan. It's to go essentially crunch the numbers to understand what are based on new data such as the ONS um, forecast on population growth, so on, but also our uh, uh, our information, our understanding of what sort of economic investment is uh, uh, anticipated. So this sort of information goes in to technical work to understand well, what's the level of growth that we as a council should be aspiring to in terms of uh, our future development. Uh, and then things like housing numbers uh, and uh, affordable housing need and so on all relate to that uh, in order to produce what is our overall um, proposed number of new homes for the next 10 to 15 years. OK, I'm not sure I got a, an answer in terms of an actual figure there, I'm sure. But I'm no, sure you that, won't. I, Sorry, I Councillor, just to say you it. won't have a figure yet. There is no figure yet. So okay. that's the work that needs to be done over the course of uh, this year, next year. Uh, it, it's 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 a, an extensive piece of underpinning evidence that is already underway. Um, but the, the, there is no figure as it stands. The figure comes out after all of that sort of extensive technical work, which will produce the figure that goes into the draft new plan years down the line. So if we don't know the figures yet, why are we asking for candidate site proposals when the figures might reduce? That's because the process requires that candidate sites is the first stage in producing a development plan. The, the, the Welsh Government's manual says the first thing every council must do is invite the submission of, uh, of, of, of candidate land so that the council starts from the off the, to uh, consider what available land there is to uh, potentially allocate whilst it does all its technical uh, work in terms of understanding the levels of growth required. It could be that everything is that, that's actually submitted, none of it is needed to be allocated because all of your land is available within your uh, settlement limits and your brownfield land that's available. But that, uh, that, that only becomes known much further down the line, once all the all the technical work I've described has been has been done, and you understand whether or not there is a need for allocations, and by then you've done your assessments of sites, so you know which ones are suitable or not. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Tom. Can I can I give a commitment to this particular time? I think will be this is a huge implication for this authority, and I'm more than willing to give a commitment that we will have a, a seminar on this thing because that as part of the consultation going forward to, so that we all understand the process 
and and what the outcomes can be. So at this point, more than yeah, and and accept views from, from members at that particular point, and give a commitment. The members will have an input in developing this this document throughout this process as well. Okay. The report has been moved and seconded. So can I have a show of hands to accept the report, please? Anybody against? Any abstentions? Put your hand down, David. You've turned voting in twice. <laughs> okay. Is it against of abstention? Abstentions. Okay, thank you. Okay, that um, vote has been carried. Next item is item 13, and that's the amendments to the Council's constitution. So can I call on Deb Smith, please? Thank you, presiding member. Um, this is a relatively straightforward report. The purpose is to address um, an anomaly between uh, there's an inconsistency between the scheme of delegation and the land transaction procedure rules. They don't quite marry up, and that's been um, highlighted um, through uh, some previous transactions. So we need to address that. On page 440, the amendment has been outlined there in bold type. The amendment is uh, to the scheme of delegation. And the words there, delegated authority will also be given to responsible officers for disposals and lease transactions where the land transaction rules do not apply. So it's proposed that that's amended um, by adding those words. And then there's some renumbering then of um, C and D paragraphs to follow. But other than that, uh, that's the that's the purpose of the report, just to add those words. So unless there's any questions, um, can I ask somebody to move the report, please? Thank you, President. Ma'am, there's, there's nothing wrong with the report. The, the only issue that was brought up in Constitutional Working Group was um, the reporting back of the uh, the what the officers have done. And I think that is a very important issue for members to understand what schema delegation has done, what has been delegated in their names, because at the moment, very much of that is not known by members, and I think we've got to be a bit more transparent for members to see what's happened. Yes, absolutely agree. Um, at the moment, the the best visibility is on those decisions that are made by Cabinet. They're published, you can see them. Um, work is being done, as we speak, really, on a scheme of uh, delegation reporting for um, delegated decisions, and that really needs to be uh, extended as, as as widely as possible so there's visibility at the moment um there's some reporting of delegated decisions on contract award reports and on certain transactions over certain values but that really does need to be broadened thank you deb yeah more than happy to second uh, sorry more than happy to propose this report <laughs> thank you a second please. happy to second okay the recommendation is on page 438 is that the amendments are outlined in section 1.8 of this report are recommended to council for adoption into the council's constitution so can i have a show of hands for please anybody against any abstentions okay that's moved then thank you very much the next item is membership of committees and that's Councillor David Hopkins, please. It's the last one for me, I promise. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, no, I got not, nothing just to um, move the, the nominations as, as put forward. Councillor Lewis. Happy to second. Thank you. Okay, the recommendation is the amendments to the council body listed in paragraph two be approved. So can I have a show of hands for, please? Anybody against? And any abstentions? Okay, that's moved then. Thank you. The next, we move on to councillors' questions. And the first one, any supplementaries from Francesca? Oh, she's left. Uh,
Sorry, they seem to have left the building, so I'm going to carry on with the next question, OK? So the next one, any supplementaries on Mike Lewis or Wendy or Mike White, please? No? Councillor Rice. Just one quick supplementary on this. Um, how many of the projects do you think are going to be completed within the next four years? And how much council public money is going to be spent on them? Well, I would hope that all of them will be completed within the next four years. Whether they will uh, remains to be seen. How much money? Um, I have to have a, a written answer to that, but I, I haven't got a, a crystal ball. You know, it's four years is a long time, especially under the government we've got in the moment with infl rampant inflation going on. Um, so I suppose it's finger in the air to try and find out that figure. But uh, you know, if you really want a written re response to a, a question, that's probably impossible to answer. I'll ask the officers to do their best, but I think they've probably got better things to do. But if you want, do you want a written reply? We do it. No, that's fine, Councillor Francis Davis. I, I think I could work it out from the capital plan. OK, move on to question three then. And that's any supplementaries, Councillor Walton? No, no supplementary. I, I, I thank the, the councillors for asking this question because of all the things that have happened due to Brexit. Uh, I think this is the one which is going to affect uh, infrastructure development in Wales. Uh, and we had the levelling up fund, which is we were told is going to compensate Wales for uh, the loss of funding from uh, that's two and and from convergence. The reality is it's going to go near it. And when we look at the Heads of the Valley Road, which is going to be one of the most important developments, uh, I know there are many people who don't like that development, but the reality is it brings about 8 million people within an hour, hour and a half drive of Swansea uh, and, and our tourist destinations. Um, and I think it's really important to remember how that was being funded, and that has been funded through, partially funded through EU funding. Now, whether or not we would get that under any government, let alone the one we have at the moment, is difficult to, to assess. And I think also in higher education, and we know that Swansea University has lost and other universities have lost uh, jobs because of the reduction in EU funding. So I think the, the, the answer to the question is, is very appropriate. And I think that we should all be aware the consequences of us leaving the EU Forget about anything else. The, the funding that we were promised is coming nowhere near it. Thank you. It's a good statement, but not me. I totally <laughs> echo everything you say, actually, because you are right. There will no way we'll let, even touch the laces about what we're trying to do in Swansea. Definitely not. Anybody online, Mr. Evans? I can't see. No. OK, we move on to the next question then. Ask some councillors, Peter Black, I don't think it's your Sam, or Mary, are you going to speak? Thank you, presiding member. Um, I just would like the cabinet member to look again about the, it says all rates, including discounts, are also available via the My Permit app. They're not. It's very, very difficult to access. Some It depends where you are in the city, actually. Some come up very well when you buy the car. Oh, is it you? Sorry, I do apologise. It's Andrew. Sorry, Cyril, uh, but if they just you know, don't bring up the options. As it said, where possible, instructions are fixed to machines. They're only a piece of paper with cell tape, and obviously people are, well, some people are removing them, shall we say, and it is very difficult for people to access the residents or even the blue badge. I've had more complaints about accessing the blue badge. They don't realise they have to press the button twice, and on my permit, it sometimes doesn't even exist. So will you look at it again, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, we are we have raised with my permit about uh, one or two issues that we we've been having with the with the residence permit part of of the app. So yes, more, more than happy to look at that. Um, 
it is clear on the machines that that you can change the tariff but what 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 has happened is the we've had a delay in our signage which is which has caused the need to put it on but that that should be rectified uh, as soon as possible thank you councillor rice three quick questions on this one actually um first question is are all the machines now up to date with the signage and the fees that were proposed uh, the second one is really a more general one. How do you feel the implementation of the new parking charges has gone? And the third one would be, um, can you give us an up-to-date briefing of um, the current charges that are available? Because there seem to be a lot of changes and it's quite hard to keep track of them. Okay. Um, thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, yeah, as, as I said, with, with the signage, um, the, the signage will be due, due to be done. Um, shortly um in terms of the in terms of the car parking charges um so our charges have not increased since 2014 um these were were actually lowered uh, further um to support the businesses in the bounce back from covid um a lot of criticism rightly or wrongly um was in comparison to the two pound all day offer that was implemented during covid um and despite this this was never actually a genuine reflection um of the uh car parking charges um and as i'm sure you're aware uh, car parks are not free to maintain uh and they do need to raise revenue and and uh, i did say at at cabinet um that we would look to work with uh, city center businesses um and implement offers and promotions um and that's exactly what we've done um so we introduced our uh, free parking weekends as well as the continued um, our extremely popular free bus travel initiative. Uh, we implemented season passes um, so workers can park from as little as 1.35 a day. Uh, and we are implementing a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 offer um, from July 24th, where shoppers can pay a pound, a pound uh, an hour up to five pound all day. Um, so I, I do I do believe our parking offers are some of the most comprehensive anywhere in the UK. Um, so um, as I said, when we're in, in cabinet, when the cabinet came, the report came, we did say we'd be mo mo mobilizing to in uh, to put offers in place. So. Councillor Stevens, Councillor O'Brien. Hi, yeah, just sorry, just to add to the car parking oh, charges. Connor, sorry, I called you the wrong name. Sorry, sorry, Francesca. <laughs> you knew what I meant. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, just about the car parking charges, basically. We've had quite a few complaints, obviously, from businesses um, in Mumbles as well and people coming in of the increase in car parking charges. And Swansea um, train station has gone up, I've noticed, to um, if you go in there also, I think it's before 8am in the morning you're charged the overnight fee of an additional £3, making it £11 a day. And if, you, if you're working in Cardiff and you're coming out of Swansea and you're trying to be environmentally friendly, obviously the cost of the train and then to park the, the car at Swansea train station is actually discouraging many people from travelling by train to Cardiff. And um, I just thought I'd highlight that if there's any plans to bring those down too. Yeah, so um, in, in terms of the high, high, high street car parking charges, yes, there were some oversights with with uh, some of the, the tariffs, but as I said, we moved quickly to rectify those issues. Um, and I guess there is a conversation potentially of whether we subsidise in car parking in order for someone to work in Cardiff effectively. Um, so what um, for in for Mumble, so the 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 COVID offer was aimed primarily at um, the city centre at the start of the pandemic, but uh, the beach and foreshore um, apply seasonal discounts um, when car parking usage is actually lower. Um, and these were actually worked up with coastal businesses. Um, and we have said um, that we are happy to look at uh, amending any future foreshore, any future foreshore discounts, um, which are applied during the winter season, if it's something a business wants us to review. Okay, no, nobody online, Mr. Evans, is there? Okay, thank you. The next is from uh, Councillor Francesca O'Brien. No supplementaries, thank you. Question six is from Councillor Wendy Lewis. Any supplementaries? No supplementaries. Thank you. The next one is from Councillor Andrew Williams. No supplementaries. 
The next Luis and Francesca O'Brien. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fogarty. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, would the cabinet member agree? Um, I'm sure that we all recognise the issues with bus services that are described in the question. Um, but actually, that's because what we've got in Swansea is uh, a bus business rather than a service. Um, and would you agree that that is as a result of the deregulation and privatisation of our bus services that was actually a Tory led policy in the 1980s? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We move on to the next question then, and that's from Councillor Sam Bennett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Member. Um, I just wanted some clarity on the bottom paragraph about the home um, safety, the Home Office um, Safe the Streets fund, funding. Um, I'm not clear as whether we did apply or we didn't apply. Um, so if we can, a bit of clarity as to whether did we apply or did we not apply? And if we didn't apply, why didn't we? Um, it's just that um, this, uh, there was what 1.5 million available in the fund, half a million to Cardiff, half a million to no 750,000 to Cardiff, 750,000 to Bridgend. So had we got it, it would have been half a million, which is as, almost as much funding as we've got in every other um, fund that's listed there. Yeah, no, we didn't apply for the, the, for this one. Um, they they did make the decisions the, that we had applied in the in the previous one, and, and we were obviously applying for all the others that are in here as well, but. When what some of the other areas were the funding for, we already have, we're already ahead. So when they sort of give the sort of narrative for, you know, the criteria to fit, we'd already sort of done that, uh, especially with the the purple badge, you know, and the purple flag and safety, we'd already sort of were light years ahead. But also it's a tiny team, do you, know, do you know what I mean? So it's just when you're applying for lots of grants, you have to pick cherry pick really which ones you can you think you can get the most out of but this time round now we're waiting ready to go again so um hopefully it'll be able to earn and we'll we'll have something but uh yeah so no i suppose is the short answer thank you councillor Pew. councillor mary jones thank you i'm very reassured actually to hear the cabinet members say that um, we may be applying in the future because my uh, question is on page four four sorry, 455, about the uh, Home Office Safer Streets funding. And as you uh, may be aware, I think you are, because you attend the meetings, in the Antisocial Behaviour Inquiry, you uh, interviewed young people. And in the uh, South Wales Police uh, News from the Police and Crime Commissioner, it says about expanding the South Wales Police Safety Bus Project, uh, supporting vulnerable people in the nighttime economy, and young people did make the point that they didn't feel that safe coming in to Swansea on a bus. So uh, hopefully that if we can have some money, then, and then we can address some of the issues that have come up in that actual inquiry. Uh, and, you know, for the this particular fund, you really need a partnership work in, do you know what I mean? So you can't, you can't sort of just do them on your own. You all have to be sort of ready for it. But definitely, like like you said, the young people, they, they particularly highlighted the bus and that and that also they get blamed for things. And very often it's adults that are actually causing the the the, the, the problems, do you know what I mean? So, so yeah, definitely there's a piece of work to, to be done around there. Councillor Walton. Yeah, would the um, cabinet member agree that this question is a bit bizarre that it says to make the streets safer for women and girls? I would have thought the council, all of us here, want to make our streets safer for everybody and that everybody has at some point or other the possibility of being vulnerable. So to call, just to refer to both um, women and girls, and I also assume then, if you've literally taken that, there are probably other pots of money and other grants that this council goes for, because I know that the um, a lot of the staff, particularly in poverty unit, do a heck of a lot of work to try and support residents across Swansea. And thank you, Councillor Walton, you, Councillor Walton for, for, for that, you know, for that. And yes, of course, it isn't women and, and girls alone. It's everybody out there and everybody can find themselves, unfortunately, in a vulnerable position, you, you know. Um, but and you're right, the poverty team, there's there's a lot of work goes on there, but they all work in partnership. There isn't, you know, to be fair, 
all our teams within the local authority and the third sector, the, you know, whoever can draw down on something yeah, and we, we best fits, you, you know, um, deliver sort of thing. So, yeah, thank you. Councillor Hennigan. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the Cabinet member will agree the Antisocial Behaviour Scrutiny Inquiry Panel um, of a meeting now in September and the recommendations on antisocial behaviour and quite a lot have come in regarding young people at water bus stations and things like this. And the recommendations will go to Cabinet sometime in October. And can I thank the Cabinet member and the Cabinet member Heidi for attending that excellent meeting in Brynavid about three weeks ago. In yeah, I think it would be remiss perhaps when we look in at this about our safe as ones. It was Councillor Holly said earlier, really about safeguarding our nighttime economy, which is exceptionally um, good in Swansea. We have again had the purple flag for the, the third third time running. Um, we're the first area to, to get this flag on the three occasions that we bid. And it's that is the, the, the safer Swansea partnership working with our local authority, our city centre management, the city rangers working with bid, and you see the um, taxi marshals, the, the street pastors. The amount of work that is being put into our nighttime economy has actually transformed, I think, the safety in um, what is always portrayed by the the Cardiff, or is it Cardiff, or is it the Welsh media, or well, probably not even the Cardiff or Welsh media, is probably Reach PLC that, I don't know if they have an office in Swansea anymore, or print in Wales even, but there we are. Um, they always seem to reflect on Swansea uh, and nighttime economy not being safe. Well, it is safe. It's a very good nighttime economy. It's got this purple flag. That just doesn't happen. That's all the partnerships working together to make sure that we uh, are of the highest standards and, and, and really our, our staff do a great job the next morning after, you know, perhaps there's lots of rubbish left, it's cleaned up, but the, uh, the, the night pastors and, and the way we deal, deal people perhaps who are possibly drunk too much at times, they are people that are looked after. So we do the best to make sure that the city centre is welcoming and actually people feel safe. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor. So, can I give a point of information? Oh. I did indicate. Sorry, sorry do you mind? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Councillor Walton said about why we said women. The actual fund was about funding worth almost 1.5 million to deliver a series of initiatives aimed at keeping women safe. We agree we want to keep everybody safe, but this fund was specifically for that. So that's where the question came from, not something that we plucked out of the air. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, only, only just to add on um, uh, what Councillor Francis Davis was just saying then about the purple flag. We are working community safety within the unions we're going to, and we'll bring it to council soon, hopefully, about um, getting me home safe, about bringing, getting staff home safe uh, from staff that work till the middle of the night and things like that. So um, I will bring that soon. OK, the next question is from Councillor Michael Locke. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the only comment I would like to make is that the bus service in Swansea now is actually a bit of a shambles. Um, when it was privatised in the early 80s, it did work okay, but now it's it has degraded and it's actually very poor. And that's the only comment I would like to make. Hall, do you want to come in first and then we yeah, I, I think every I think anyone who ever assumes public transport will tell you that it's whether it's on a train or, or on a bus, the, the position of our transport infrastructure, not just in Swansea, but in South Wales, but in the UK is appalling. Um many I, I I'm sure the cabinet member would agree with me that when we, this question was asked some years ago, the then cabinet member for um uh, environment and infrastructure was um, Mark Thomas, who totally agreed with us. 
that uh, whenever this became available, that we should seriously consider going back to having a municipal um, uh, bus company. The, 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 reason, the reason we should do it is not just as a, a question of subsidizing, it's a question of making it available for people because the, at the moment we have to pay a subsidy anyway to, to, to uh, the bus companies for certain routes. And I can remember many years ago having to pay an enormous amount of money to a bus company for a route. Um, and it would have been cheaper to have taxis. But the truth of the matter is we need bus services and we need good quality bus services and we need them timely and we need them to run on a way in which they are available for the public. So I think anything when this when we have an opportunity to do this, we really need to look at how we how we can finance it. And I, I think um, doing it under the city deal, and I won't mention that word that will, that will haunt me for the rest of my life, uh, um, which is working in Cardiff, but unfortunately didn't work in Swansea. So I think we, we need to seriously consider when it becomes available, how we finance it, and if we can do it. Um. I don't think well. I think the vast majority of the people in in this uh, chamber today, I wouldn't say all the people in this chamber, vast majority, is appalled at the service that we get. We have not got a public transport system. What we have is a private transport system that is there for profit, not for people. And what we need is a transport system. And I personally don't care if it is subsidised, as long as it is effective and efficient and gets people around our city. I know there are people in my ward that can't get home uh, when they finish in university at night to their lectures at five o'clock up to Kaimau. Now, that is an absolute disgrace. And it was deregulation of the bus service, which was sold by, I think it was Margaret Thatcher, wasn't it? You know, that, that wonderful Tory that actually, you know, sold off the council houses. I know it's the 7,000 people we got on our council house waiting list now. Um, you know, people want to have their own houses. We buses now, uh, Councillor RSD, not houses. Well, I, I'm just giving background to the person that made the decision of um, deregulating this bus service. I remember it was welcomed at the time by uh, my good friend Richard Lewis. He's not here now. We remember we we're going to have these buses coming along smaller buses like the Gower Pony that would be coming off the main routes, be nipping here and everywhere. You could hail it and stop it and they'll pick you up. This wonderful um, private transport system. But the reality is it is not a public transport system. And the sooner we get back in this country to a public transport system that is there for people, not for profit, then we can all celebrate. Well, the majority of us in in this room will celebrate, not all, unfortunately. Sorry, I'm just wondering, if we're running our own national curriculum here in Wales, can't we run our own bus service too? Could I look? I, I do share the concerns about the bus service within the city. It is very concerning. I think public transport itself is very concerning. What I will say, I think Councillor Andrew Stevens and the leader have been particularly active looking at the Metro campaigning with Welsh Government to, to try to get a metro system up and running to give competition to our uh, to, to thing. I think competition is healthy. And I think the sooner that we get other operators on board to work in competition with any pro uh, provider, the better, the sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. But I can guarantee you we're not sitting down. The leader and Andrew, Andrew Stevens at this particular time are lobbying Welsh Government. And I'm conscious that we hope we could get you know, a, a, an announcement very shortly on all these issues. So um, I thank you, Andy, for, for, for your perseverance, I would say, there as well. And so, Stephen, do you wish to make a comment? Are you okay? Well, no, Chair, I, I don't think I can add anything to that. I think it was all pretty much covered, wasn't okay. it? So, they all uh... jumped in before you could answer, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> okay, thank you. The next question then is from Councillor Mary Jones. Any supplementaries? I'm sorry to end with you, uh, Councillor Hopkins, seeing as you've been hogging the uh, agenda. Uh, you have to excuse me, I've scribbled all over the place, so I hope I got in the right order. Um, I was quite disappointed uh, in April, I think it was, we went to a site visit 
uh, in West Cross, and it was a site by exception, um, and it was common land, but there were all, also peat reserves. And it seemed to me that, see, a way it came over is if they weren't important. I'm not talking about where the upland, which is in the uh, response about wind farms and things like that, where you pour the concrete in. This was a smaller area, which actually, if there's a lot of small areas, it still has a cumulative impact. And there was no sort of uh, acceptance almost of the fact that you shouldn't disturb the peat. It is a carbon uh, trap. And even in the um, LGP that we've just been looking through, it's all about um, biodiversity, ecosystems and that. And every councillor gets a calendar. And on this calendar this year, there was actually a picture of them trying to restore peat bogs and peat fields. And I'm really disappointed that we didn't seem to accept the fact that it is important to, you know, to preserve the peat. But also, because it's a site by exception, they seem to be able to do what they like. If it had been something, this was obviously a, a social housing provider, and I'm not saying we don't need the houses. I'm saying we need to be smarter looking at the sites that we're using. Uh, because if it had been a, an ordinary house builder, they certainly wouldn't have been able to build on that land. So can I have a reassurance going forward that we look into more detail about if we are disturbing the peat? And I'm not talking about just the major things with the wind farms, which they say the wind overrides the peat, which I don't like, but I have to accept. I haven't got the details of that particular case in front of me, so I won't comment, but I will give a commitment on the new LDP. All these things will be looked at, and particularly we will be taking evidence from, from you know, specific pe people on biodiversity, carbon footprint. So we will be looking at all these issues. So that commitment is, is definitely there. Ms. Sharon. Thank you. Yes, it was just the last sentence in the answer that I was rather curious about. Because it does say, um, finally, and to enable the full reinstatement of the special landscape quality following the decommissioning of any wind energy generation development. Um, what puzzles me about that is that what I've read about turbines erected on, um, you know, high areas with with considerable peat is that there are tons and tons of concrete put into the soil and that when decommissioning takes place it is only the top meter approximately that is removed now unless there's been any change and this is what i'm wondering you know i find that quite shocking because peat land valuable landscapes are going to have even if the turbines go are going to be changed for posterity because of the concrete in the soil. So just wondered if you had any comments on that statement. I don't share the professionalism that you've got on this particular subject in any shape or form, but what I will be doing is give, give you a particularly written answer on that because I haven't got that technical data in front of me. Okay, thank you. That's the end of the question. Oh, sorry. Sorry again. Yeah. So I was just going to say um, we've we've encountered this on many of the Guire with the wind turbines that were built up there, and I must say that the developer uh, did not look after the peat that was taken away from on that site. That was uh, a, an absolute tragedy, and it should have been managed a lot better. I think you'll find that there could be more planning applications coming forward for wind turbines on our common land in Swansea. And if that happens again, then we seriously need to look at the way our planning uh, project is because we failed on that. And, and you can see up there now, if you walk up there and see it, that the, the land has not gone back to as it should be. And it is a, it is a big failure. Again, I wouldn't have that technical expertise, but I, and I cannot give any commitment about new developments. I know that, that there is an energy crisis. And I know that uh, Welsh Government will look at this in a very serious manner. Uh, all I can do is we can do our best locally there and try to manage when it do come. And that'll be obviously with the planning committee to do so. But yeah, I, I'm 
conscious I will give a written answer on that particular one as well. But I will look into the, to the way that was handled at, at that particular site. Okay, that's the end of the questions. And you bang on 30 minutes. That was well timed, folks. Okay, we move on to the notices of motion. And the first one is from uh, Councillor Chris Holly. Thank you, Presiding Member. I, I don't think there's anybody who can disagree with the fact that this policy of ours um, is, is right and proper. And, and I think that I know there's exceptions to this. And I, I was explained to me earlier on about how in the farming community there is there is a difference in, in, in the way in which this is carried out. But I think that the whole policy that we have should be have more publicity. I think we should, not only should be on the website, but we should inform the RSPCA that we we do not allow prices of live animals in any of our uh, sites, whether it's our own land or if it's a license being applied for for other people's land. And I think that, as I say, I think everybody would agree with this. I think it's OK, it was all right in the 50s and 60s. We know a lot more intelligence. We now know what's going on with life. And I think we, we should all support this notice of motion. Yeah, please. I'm happy to second that. And I, I would just echo Councillor Holly's comments. Just to very quickly add myself as well, that I, I, I emailed officers about a year ago on exactly this subject and was delighted to see that this is already a banned practice. However, it must be said that pets have been given out as prizes on council land. I don't want to go into the details of that, but just to say we need to publicise that this is our policy because it's a good policy for the council. Councillor Jones, do you want to come in first? Councillor Jones, uh, uh, presiding member, I was just going to say that I support the motion uh, because I think it is important that uh, you know we look after you know uh, our, our, our animals and live animals as pets as as prizes is certainly not acceptable. Hopkins. Yeah, I'd certainly like to support this motion. I can confirm the Labour Group will be supporting this motion today. I'm sure that uh, it's reiterating our existing policy and anything we can do to publicise that. But I, I would actually say our trading standards regularly enforce this. It's not just the RSPCA. We, we actively campaign and work. But any of you are quite right, spot on, that we do need to, to announce this. We need to make sure that everybody's aware of this particular thing because it's not acceptable. I will totally support that. Thank you. Um, we support the motion as well. Um, we, we raised it last year as a, a question to council about this time last year. And um, I think it's really important to, to pick up the, the elements of this motion, which are ensuring that the various different organisations connected to this campaign are aware, because I can remember looking back um, a year ago, they, they weren't aware and we weren't amongst the list of authorities that, that did this. So I think it's important to make sure we become that. Mr. Yeah, this, this notice motion won't do any harm to support this because it was many years ago that we had brought this policy in. I remember we brought it in with the old Leisure Services Committee to make sure that um, animals weren't used as prizes. I'm very proud. I remember when I stopped like elephants coming into the circuses because, you know, it was sad to see animals just in cages sway in back and forth. That's that's not right. You know, to, you know, people should see animals in the natural environment, or actually when they got room around them, not put into cages. I think we, you know, we've always been a front runner in Swansea in the protection of animals, and, and I think that's only right. Um, it doesn't do any harm. As it, it is already our policy. Um, environmental health have always been on top of it. The, the leisure department, the events, when they let it, it is part of that policy. But I think it doesn't harm to remind people and to remind the RSPCA as well as their policy. They shouldn't need reminding, but uh, it won't do any harm um, to make sure that and where we as members see if people are offering animals as prizes, we should be reporting it, especially if it's on our land. Is there anybody online, Mr. Evans? Sorry, because I can't see. No. Okay. Can I have a show of hands in support of the notice of motion then, please? Anybody against? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. That one's carried. 
Move on to the next notice of motion, and it's coming from Councillor Rob Stubbery. Councillor Hopkins, you lead in. Yeah, thanks, presiding member. Um, I take no comfort in actually having to move this uh, this notice of motion. I think it's probably the most difficult one I've ever had to do. I think it's quite sorry state that we're in that, that we, we find ourselves having to move this uh, notice of motion. What I would say, there's a common thread here, you know. During COVID, our care workers particularly worked in bubbles. Our refuse collectors worked in bubbles. Over Christmas, you weren't allowed to mingle with your friends or family. We had to be stick to bubbles. People die in a lonely thing. And I look around this chamber, I know there's certain people in this chamber couldn't even be with their family when they were dying. The only common thread here in Westminster, the only bubbles we could see was in the buck phase, in my opinion. And I think it's a sad, so sorry state we're in that we find ourselves. Now, what I would hope we do in moving this, this uh, notice of motion, that we have a unanimous um, support across this thing. It is, it is absolutely diabolical. The British po politics are in this state at the moment, and I hope that we, we can all stick together and, and support this notice of motion um, for this very, very, in my opinion, absolutely ridiculous thing that's gone on within Westminster. So I saw move the report. Thank you, presiding member. It gives me no pleasure to second this notice of motion. Uh, every single person in this chamber, we are community leaders. Every single person in this chamber, I'm sure, followed the rules to the letter. The leader, Councillor Hopkins and myself, along with the current chief executive at the time, held daily executive control groups to talk and discuss how we could follow the rules to the letter to keep people safe. This is our Prime Minister at the time. His behaviour is not only abominable, but to have the audacity not just to have parties, but to lie to the public is absolutely outrageous. Now, speaking on a personal note, um, uh, David Hop Councillor Hopkins has referred to people's personal uh, issues during this time. Uh, my mother was shielding. She has Parkinson's. I respected the rules and I did not visit her purely because I wanted to keep her safe and protect her from the COVID virus. And I'm sure there are many people in this chamber, many personal stories along those lines. But I would also not just like to raise the fact that we should be discrediting Boris Johnson, but also other Tory MPs and peers. So a report from the Privileges Committee found that former cabinet members and allies of Boris Johnson were accused of launching an unprecedented and coordinated campaign to undermine the inquiry into whether he misled Parliament at Partygate. Seven Tory MPs and three peers, including a serving government minister, were named and told their behaviour risked discrediting a fundamental arm of the system of checks and balances in Parliament. Boris Johnson's behaviour has undermined people's confidence in politics. It's discrediting it. And we know in this chamber that pol politicians, we're always continually uh, criticised, and this does not help that argument whatsoever. Moving on to our current Prime Minister. So Rishi Sunak claims he has a moral compass. He resigned from Boris Johnson's cabinet but we cannot forget that he was part of the cabinet during that time. He's claimed the moral high ground. He states that Boris asked him to do something he wasn't prepared to do because he didn't think it was right, and that was to overrule the House of Lords Appointments Committee or make promises to people, and he wasn't prepared to do that. Very well done, Rishi. Very telling that he didn't bother to turn up for the vote on the review of findings in the House of Commons. And we must not forget that Rishi Sunak in April 2022 himself was issued with a fixed penalty notice by the police who found that he committed offences under COVID-19 regulations by attending a birthday party for the Prime Minister on the 19th of June 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, our sitting Prime Minister. So, presiding member, I hope that there is a, a general election and a general election soon because actually the, the cronies 
that uh, Boris Johnson's cronies and also Rishi himself guilty of acts of breaching the regulations himself. I think it's about time we had to change the government, presiding member. Thanks, Mr. Holly. Thank you very much, presiding members. The, this notice of motion will not change uh, our government. Um, it will not change uh, the people that are in, in in Parliament at the moment, and it certainly won't change that cabinet. What this notion of what this motion does is reaffirm us as individuals our disgrace and our disgust at the way in which elected members acted in the highest offices of this country. We, all of us, and I know that there's people in the Conservative group here who stuck to the rules, who helped out distributing food, who has distributed uh, things to vulnerable people, and I know that they must feel disgusted as well as everybody else. The fact then that the man that held the highest office in this country went to Parliament and lied uh, is, well, it's just disgusting. And the fact then that people tried to undermine a joint uh, party uh, standards committee to turn around and say that privilege committee did uh, had a kangaroo court, whatever they wanted to call it, again was disgraceful. Uh, the deputy leader, uh, uh, Andrea, is quite right. Uh, it undermines the, the, if you like, the credibility of everyone from the MPs, uh, uh, from Welsh government ministers, uh, members down to us, and even community councillors, because everybody thinks you're in it for yourselves. You have marvellous parties, and uh, as, you, as the leader said, uh, deputy leader said, bucks fizz. Well, I'm afraid that's not true. We live in uh, times quite serious times. Uh, we live in times where we are likely to face austerity for the next few years. And I think that this government needs to go. The reason it needs to go is it's it's spent its time. It's shown to have a total disregard for the individual and a total disregard for the feelings of the public. Now, whether or not whatever political party it is, you have to start realising that the public have had enough. They've had enough of the lies and deceit from certain individuals in that parliament, and they need to be kicked out. I personally will support this note of motion because of that, and I'm sure many people in this chamber will agree with what I'm saying. Jones. Thank you, presiding member. I think, uh, you know, when we saw these events unfolding, they were very, very disappointing, I have to tell you. Um, you know, because I believe the UK government had done a lot of good work and are doing good work. But, you know, with regard to Swansea, the furlough scheme, which kept thousands of people in, in work, and of course the rolling out of the vaccine programme, which is one of the best in, in, in the whole of Europe and saved many, many lives. But I was disappointed to see that video too, uh, because, and quite frankly, no excuses whatsoever. There can't be, uh, because it's not good enough. Speaking personally, like many of you, and I know people in my group, we've all made sacrifices uh, during the course of the pandemic. I uh, attended a number of funerals, but a lot. I was one of a few who was allowed to actually go because we were a certain number of people allowed. And on one occasion, I couldn't go because of the rules. In my role as a councillor, we set up a community hub uh, and, uh, you know, to help local people and a grub club delivering food to the elderly every week for over two years. And in fact, uh, your former colleague, uh, uh, Mark Child, Councillor Mark Child, delivered our 500th meal during the course of, of that uh, time. Uh, and following lockdown, we carried on. We're still doing coffee meetings to bring people together. I did remembrance services in my ward with a member of the clergy, just the two of us, with nobody else actually allowed to stand up, uh, to, to come along. Uh, so we had to represent the community. Uh, but like many of you, we were doing the right thing. And so the, I'm very, very disappointed 
with what had happened and we will be for we don't i don't actually like some of the wording in your motion as you would expect but we will be voting for it thank you president member um th this week we celebrated the 75th anniversary of our national health service and i think what has annoyed me most about the excuses and the um, discussion had is that actually the people who worked in the NHS gave up so much and sacrificed a lot. I know colleagues who didn't see their families for months on end because they took themselves into isolation so that they could continue to do their job um, and protect their families and lots of sacrifices were made and yeah I'm absolutely sure those staff working in the NHS would have loved to have gone out and had parties to let their hair down under probably the most stressful times that they've ever worked on but they didn't they kept by the rules they made sacrifices and they carried on and I think that's one thing that rings true to me it is how difficult and that's why I, su I support this uh, motion as well um, and I think as, as referenced in the motion about the honours I think it also shows how completely broken and unfit for purpose our honours system is. Councillor King, uh, Councillor Victoria Holland. Thank you. Sorry, I, I was going to say something before Councillor Lynch and Jones said that he'd be supporting the motion, that some of the things were a lot to do with the Welsh Government, especially the vaccine rollout. But ultimately, this is not about political parties today. It's about human decency and all of the country was impacted in so, so many ways. So I think I think we have to and we have to do it. So we, we stand up for other people and we stand up for Swansea. Mr O'Connor. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I absolutely don't agree with the lockdown parties, of course, um, and equally don't agree with tarring any of us here with the same brush, but I know you didn't do that, um, Councillor Holly, either. Um, politics aside here, I'm sure that all of us have many stories. We stuck to the rules, um, but I'm equally sure that many of us here know people that absolutely didn't stick to the rules as well. Um, likewise, some people wanted the jab and some people didn't want the jab. I absolutely support this notion. I remember the 30th of November. I remember calling the ambulance, my grandfather, who'd had a fall, he went into hospital, he didn't come back out, he caught COVID. And that's the reality for many of us here who know people. And my sister having to go into labour on that very same day, the 30th of November. So yeah, 100%, we do not agree with, with that either. Thank you. I support this motion and what annoys me is the utter contempt at a contempt held by Boris Johnson and others in the way that they've misled the public, lied to Parliament. I don't think you can get a worse thing, but even some of them, others, you know, the, you saw the video. Every, nobody can be anything but appalled to see that video cavorting around while lots of us were sticking to our bubbles. The Majesty the Queen, you know, a solitary figure sitting in Westminster on her own, disgraceful and contemptible of the highest order. And then people were in that video getting rewarded with an honour. They not, should never have any honour. In fact, they don't have honour you know, by accepting it. My brother was in hospital for months died Christmas Day, couldn't be there. Councillor Fogarty. Thank you. I don't want to be speaking on this motion, but I feel that I have to to demonstrate an example of what a politician can be and should be, because what we're seeing coming out of Westminster is absolutely what a politician should never be. And it has to be unacceptable and we have to expect better. Um, we've all got our own personal stories to tell. And I feel like I have to represent the women who, like myself, went through pregnancy and childbirth during lockdown. So some of the images I have in my mind are of sitting on my own in a hospital corridor with a suspected miscarriage and my husband not being able to be there because we were following the rules. And then when my son was born, and we had to go back into hospital for his first week of life. Again, being on my own, my husband not being able to be there, not being able to visit, even when he dropped off clothes for my newborn son, not being able to come and meet his 
his first child for that first week because we were following the rules. So for Boris Johnson and his friends, let's not leave them out of it because they have got as much blame to shoulder on this as anybody else. For them to not only completely disregard the rules that they set, but then lie about it and then try to discredit the people who are bringing what actually happened to light and into the public domain is just absolutely contemptible. And I totally understand why people don't trust politicians anymore, because if you can't keep the rules that you make, then why should the public trust you? So I'm speaking today and I'm supporting this motion because politicians are not all Boris Johnson. In fact, everybody you know in this room will be supporting this motion. We are all much, much better than him. And that is what the public should expect of us. Professor Bailey. Thank you very much. I don't often speak in this chamber. I think, I think this is the first time I've ever spoken, actually. Um, and I usually steer clear of motions too. Um, they're often political point scoring, but I think this is past that. Um, we've all got stories, and I'm sure we've all we can all talk all night about them. Personally, I managed care homes um, for the years before I became a councillor. Um, lived in work for weeks without going home to see my family, as many other people in care homes did. I also helped look after all the people in their own homes. Um, and one couple I looked after, 82 years of age, they spent two years without leaving the house because they were so petrified of leaving, they wanted to stick by the rules. As restrictions were lifted, they brought them into a care home and they died within a week of each other. So we, there's, there's lots of other stories I could spend all night, but and I usually stay away, but I think, uh, as you said, you make the rules, you stick by them, you lead by example. Um, so on this case, I, I will be supporting as well tonight. Is there anybody online, Mr. Evans? Sorry, I can't see you. No. Okay, is there anybody else indicating? No. So I'm going to move the report, please. So everybody in favour? Thank you. Anybody against? Any abstentions? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. David, what comes up, please? But I thank this chamber for this unanimous decision. I really, really do appreciate the support and some of the very touching comments that was made here. So I just want to put my record and thanks to every member of this chamber that uh, has contributed tonight tonight and voted to support this motion. OK, thank you, everybody. That's the end of the agenda for this evening. I thank you all for your attendance. Yeah. Oh, my God, I want to go.